A Tale for the Time Being Novel by Ruth Ozeki Ruth Interesting about the crows Oliver said tentatively Ruth closed the diary and looked over at her husband He lay on his back in bed head propped up against the pillow staring down at his toes She studied his clean chiseled profile and marveled After everything she just read about Nao's life the girl's father her situation at school that his mind would alight upon the crows there were so many other more pressing things she would have preferred to discuss and she was about to say so when the slight hesitation in his words made her pause he was aware that his responses were often irregular and she knew this worried him he wasn't trying to annoy her quite the opposite she took a deep breath crows she repeated Yes. What about them? Well, he said, sounding relieved. It's just funny that she should mention them because I've been doing some reading about Japanese crows. The native species there is Corvus japonensis, which is a subspecies of Corvus macrorhynchus, the large-billed or jungle crow. It's quite different from the American crow. This is Canada, she said, interrupting him even as her mind drifted elsewhere. We should have Canadian crows. She was imagining Nao's father sitting on his bench. Every morning he woke, got dressed in his cheap blue suit, ate his breakfast, walked his daughter to school. Maybe he'd fish a copy of the morning newspaper out of the recycling on his way to the park to read on the bench. Well, yes, Oliver said. As I was about to say, the crow native to these parts is Corvus corinus. the northwestern crow almost identical to the american crow only smaller figures she said did he have a special bench he liked more than others he'd sit down and read the paper and study the racing form maybe in the afternoon he'd feed the crows crumbs from his sandwich or grains of rice from his rice bowl before taking a nap stretched out on his bench with the newspaper covering his face Did he really think he could get away with it? Oliver had fallen silent. I didn't know we had crows at all, she said quickly to show she was still listening. I thought we just had ravens. We do, he said. We have both crows and ravens. Same genus. Different birds. And that's the weird part of it. He sat up in bed and waited until he had her full attention before continuing. The other day, when you came back with the freezer bag, I was out in the garden and I heard the ravens talking. They were up in a fire, making a lot of noise, flapping around, all excited. I looked up and saw that they were harassing a smaller bird. The smaller bird kept trying to approach them, but they kept picking on it. until finally it flew over to the fence near where i was working it looked like a crow only it was bigger than corvus corinus with a hump on its forehead and a big thick curved beak so it wasn't a crow then no it was i think it was a jungle crow it sat there for a long time studying me so i got a really good look at it too i could swear it was corvus japonensis But what's it doing here? He was leaning forward now, his pale blue eyes fixed intently on the bed covers, as though he were trying to locate in the sheets an answer to the mystery of this geographical displacement. The only thing I can think of is that it rode over on the flotsam. That it's part of the drift. Is that possible? He ran his hands across the blanket, smoothing out the mountains and valleys. Anything's possible. People made it here in hollowed out logs. Why not crows? They can ride on the drift, plus they have the advantage of being able to fly. It's not impossible. It's an anomaly, is all. He was an anomaly, a sport, a deviation from the mean. Fries his fish in a different pan was the way people sometimes described him on the island. But Ruth had always been fascinated by the meandering currents of his mind and even though she often grew impatient trying to follow its flow in the end 
she was glad she did. His observations, like those concerning the crew, were often the most interesting. They'd met in the early 1990s at an artist's colony in the Canadian Rockies, where he was leading a thematic residency called End of the Nation State. She had been invited to the colony to do post-production on a film she was making at the time, and he was a passionate devotee of mid-century Japanese cinema, so they soon became friends. He used to visit her in the editing room with a six-pack, and they would drink beer and he would talk about montage and assemblage and borders and time while she carefully pieced together the frames of her movie. He was an environmental artist, doing public installations, botanical interventions into urban landscapes, he called them, on the fringes of the art establishment, and she was drawing to the unbridled and fertile anarchy of his thinking. In the flickering darkness of the editing room, she listened to him talk, and soon she had moved into his room in the dormitory. After the residency ended, they parted ways and went in opposite directions, she back to New York City, and he to the island farm in British Columbia, where he taught permaculture. Had they met even a year earlier, their affair would probably have ended then and there, but these were the early days of the internet, and they both had dial-up email accounts, which allowed them to keep the immediacy of their friendship alive. He shared a party line with three other island households, but he would wait until the middle of the night, when no one else was using the telephone, to send daily dispatches with the subject line missives from the mossy margins. In the summer, as the heavy moths beat their powdery wings against his window screen, he wrote to her about the island, describing how the berry bushes were laden with fruit and where the most succulent oysters could be found, and the way the bioluminescence lit the lapping waves and filled the ocean with twinkling planktonic forms that mirrored the stars in the sky. He translated the vast, wild, Pacific Rim ecosystem into poetry and pixels, transmitting them all the way to her small monitor in Manhattan, where she waited, leaning into the screen, eagerly reading each word with her heart in her throat, because by then she was deeply in love. That winter, they tried living together in New York, but by spring, she had again yielded to the tug and tide of his mind, allowing its currents to carry her back across the continent and wash them up on the remote shores of his evergreen island, surrounded by the fjords and snow-capped peaks of desolation sound, the tug of his mind and of the Canadian healthcare system, because he'd been stricken with a mysterious flu-like illness, and they were broke and in need of affordable health insurance. And if she was perfectly honest, she would have to acknowledge the role she played in their drift. She wanted what was best for him, wanted him to be happy and safe, but she was searching for a refugium for herself and for her mother, too. At the time, her mother was suffering from Alzheimer's disease. She had been diagnosed just a few months before Ruth's father had died, and on his deathbed, Ruth had promised him that she would care for her mother after he was gone, but then her first novel was published, and she embarked on a book tour that took her around the world twice. Caring for a demented mother in Connecticut and a chronically ill husband in Canada was clearly impossible. The only option was to consolidate her remaining family and move her mother to the island. It seemed like a good plan, so when moving day came, Ruth was content to exchange the tiny one-bedroom apartment that had been her home in Lower Manhattan for 20 acres of rainforest and two houses in Town. I'm just trading one island for another, she told her New York friends. How different could it be? It could, she learned, be very different. Town was not really a town, per se, but rather a locality defined by the province of British Columbia as a named place or area, generally with a scattered population of 50 or less. Even so, it was the second largest population centre on the island. It had once been a whaling station, from whence it derived its name, although whales were rarely seen in nearby waters anymore. Most of them had been hunted out back in 1869, when a Scotsman named James Dawson and his American partner, Abel Douglas, established the Whale Town Station and started killing whales with a new and extremely efficient weapon called a bomb lance. 
The bomb lance was a heavyweight shoulder rifle that fired a special harpoon, fitted with a bomb and time delay fuse, which exploded inside the whale just seconds after penetrating its skin. By mid-September of that year, Dawson and Douglas had shipped more than 450 barrels of oil, 20,000 gallons, south to the United States. The primary source of oil in those days was blubber and the only way to obtain it was to mine it from the bodies of living whales. When the technology for extracting kerosene and petroleum from the prehistoric dead was commercialized in the latter part of the century, the order Cetacea stood a fighting chance of survival. You could say that fossil fuels arrived just in time to save the whales, but not in time to save the whales of Whale Town. By June of 1870, a year after the station was established, the last whales in the area either had been slaughtered or had fled, and Dawson and Douglas closed up shop and moved on, too. Whales are time beings. In May 2007, a 50 ton bowhead whale, killed by Eskimo whalers off the Ulskan coast, was found to have a three and a half inch arrow shaped projectile from a bomb lance embedded in the blubber on its neck. By dating the fragment, researchers were able to estimate the whale's age between 115 and 130 years old. Creatures who survive and live that long presumably have long memories. The waters around Whale Town were once treacherous for whales, but the ones that managed to escape learned to stay away. You can imagine them chirping and cooing to each other in their beautiful subaquatic voices. Stay away. Stay away. Every now and then, there's a whale sighting from the ferry that services the island. The captain cuts the engine and comes on the pass system to announce that a pod of orcas or a humpback has been spotted on the port side at 2 o'clock, and all the passengers flow to that side of the ship to scan the waves for a glimpse of a fiend or a fluke or a sleek dark back, rising up from the water. The tourists raise their cameras and mobile phones, hoping to capture a breach or a spout, and even the locals get excited. But mostly the whales still stay away from Whale Town, leaving only their name behind. A name, Ruth thought, could be either a ghost or a portent depending upon which side of time you were standing. The name Whale Town had become a mere specter of the past, a crepuscular Pacific shimmer, but the name Desolation Sound still hovered in a liminal space and fell to her both oracular and haunted. Her own name, Ruth, had often functioned like an omen, casting a complex shadow forward across her life. The word Ruth is derived from the Middle English Ru, meaning remorse or regret. Ruth's Japanese mother wasn't thinking of the English etymology when she chose the name, nor did she intend to curse her daughter with it, Ruth was simply the name of an old family friend. But even so, Ruth often felt oppressed by the sense of her name, and not just in English. In Japanese, the name was equally problematic. Japanese people can't pronounce R or Reth. In Japanese, Ruth is either pronounced Rutsu, meaning roots, or Rusu, meaning not at home or absent. The home they bought in Whale Town was built in a meadow lake clearing that had been hacked from the middle of the dense temperate rainforest. A smaller cottage stood at the foot of the drive where her mother would live. On all sides, massive Douglas firs, red cedars, and big leaf maples surrounded them, dwarfing everything human. When Ruth first saw these giant trees, she wept. They rose up around her, ancient time beings, towering a hundred or two hundred feet overhead. At five feet, five inches, she had never felt so puny in all her life. We're nothing, she said, wiping her eyes. We're barely here at all. Yes, Oliver said. Isn't it great? And they can live to be a thousand years old. She leaned against him, tilting her head all the way back so she could see the treetops, piercing the sky. They're impossibly tall, she said. Not impossibly, Oliver said, holding her so she wouldn't fall. It's just a matter of perspective. If you were that tree, I wouldn't even reach the bottom of your ankle bone. Oliver was overjoyed. 
He was a tree guy and had no use for tidy vegetable gardens or shallow-rooted annuals like lettuce. When they first moved in, he was still quite ill, prone to dizzy spells and easily tired, but he started a daily regimen of walking and soon he was running the trails and it seemed to Ruth as if the forest were healing him, as if he were absorbing its inexorable life force. As he ran through the dense understory, he could read the signs of arboreal intrigue, the drama and power struggles as species wide for control over a patch of sunlight, or giant furs and fungal spores opted to work together for their mutual benefit. He could see time unfolding here, and history, embedded in the worlds and fractal forms of nature, and he would come home, sweating and breathless, and tell her what he'd seen. The house was made of cedar from the forest. It was a whimsical two-story structure built by hippies in the 1970s with a shake roof, deep eaves, and a sprawling front porch overlooking the small meadow and encircled by the tall trees. The real estate agent had listed the house as having an ocean view, but the only glimpse of water it afforded was from a single window in Ruth's office, where she could see a tiny patch of sea and sky though a U-shaped notch in the treetops, which looked like an inverted tunnel. The real estate agent pointed out that they could cut down the trees that were blocking their view, but they never did. Instead, they planted more. In a futile attempt to domesticate the landscape, Ruth planted European climbing roses around the house. Oliver planted bamboo. The two species quickly grew up into a densely tangled thicket, so that soon it was almost impossible to find the entrance to the house if you didn't already know where it was. The house seemed in danger of disappearing, and by then, the meadow was beginning to shrink, too, as the forest encroached like a slow-moving coniferous wave, threatening to swallow them completely. Oliver wasn't worried. He took the long view. Anticipating the effects of global warming on the native trees, he was working to create a climate change forest on a hundred acres of clear-cut, owned by a botanist friend. He planted groves of ancient natives, metasequoia, giant sequoia, coast redwoods, juglans, ulmus, and ginkgo, species that had been indigenous to the area during the Eocene Thermal Maximum, some 55 million years ago. Imagine, he said. Palms and alligators flourishing once again as far north as Alaska. This was his latest artwork, a botanical intervention he called the Neocene. He described it as a collaboration with time and place, whose outcome neither he nor any of his contemporaries would ever live to witness, but he was okay with not knowing. Patience was part of his nature, and he accepted his lot as a short-lived mammal, scurrying in and out amid the roots of the giants. But Ruth was neither patient nor accepting, and she really liked to know. After a few short years, fifteen, to be exact, brief by his count, Interminable by hers, surrounded by all this vegetative rampancy, she was feeling increasingly unsure of herself. She missed the built environment of New York City. It was only in an urban landscape, amid straight lines and architecture, that she could situate herself in human time and history. As a novelist she needed this. She missed people. She missed human intrigue, drama and power struggles. She needed her own species, not to talk to, necessarily, but just to be among, as a bystander in a crowd or an anonymous witness. But here, on the sparsely populated island, human culture barely existed and then only as the thinnest veneer. Engulfed by the thorny roses and massing bamboo, she stared out the window and felt like she'd stepped into a malevolent fairy tale. She'd been bewitched. She pricked her finger and had fallen into a deep, coma lake sleep. The years had passed, and she was not getting any younger. She had fulfilled her promise to her father, and cared for her mother. Now that her mother was dead, Ruth felt that her own life was passing her by. Maybe it was time to leave this place she'd hoped would be home forever. Maybe it was time to break the spell. Home leaving is a Buddhist euphemism for leaving the secular world and entering the monistic path, 
which was pretty much the opposite of what Ruth was contemplating when she pondered her return to the city. Zen master Dijian uses the phrase in the merits of home leaving, which is the title of chapter 86 of his Shbijans. This is the chapter in which he praises his young monks for their commitment to a path of awakening and explicates the granular nature of time, the 6,400,099,980 moments that constitute a single day. His point is that every single one of those moments provides an opportunity to re-establish our will. Even the snap of a finger, he says, provides us with 65 opportunities to wake up and to choose actions that will produce beneficial karma and turn our lives around. The merits of home leaving was originally delivered as a lecture to the monks at Eheji, the monastery that Dijian founded, deep in the mountains of Fukui Prefecture, far away from the decadence and corruption of the city. In the Shbijans, the text of the lecture is followed by the date of its delivery, a day of the summer retreat in the seventh year of Kench. All well and good. You can imagine the pure summer heat enfolding the mountain, and the cicada's shrill cry piercing the torpid air, the monks sitting in Zedazidian for our upon hour, immobile on their damp cushions, while mosquitoes circle their shiny bald heads, and rivulets of sweat run like tears down their young faces. Time must have seemed interminable to them. All well and good, except that the seventh year of Kench corresponds with 1255 in the Gregorian calendar, and during the summer retreat that year, Zen Master Dijian, who was purportedly delivering his lecture on the merits of home leaving, was dead. He had died in 1253, two years and many moments earlier. There are several explanations for this discrepancy. The most probable is that Dijian wrote a draft of the talk several years prior to his death and, intending to revise it, had left notes and commentary to that effect, and these were later incorporated into a final version and delivered to the monks by his dharma heir, Master Con E.J. There's another possibility, however, which is that on that day in the summer of the seventh year of Kench, Zen Master Dijian wasn't entirely dead. Of course, he wouldn't have been entirely alive, either. Like Schrodinger's cat, in the quantum thought experiment, he would have been both alive and dead. The great matter of life and death is the real subject of the merits of home leaving. When Dijian exhorts his young forest monks to continue, moment by moment, to summon their resolve and stay true to their commitment to enlightenment, what he means is simply this, life is fleeting. Don't waste a single moment of your precious life. Wake up now. And now. And now. Ruth dozed in her chair in her second floor office. The bristling tower of pages that represented the last ten years of her life sat squarely on the desk in front of her. Letter by letter, page by page, she had built this edifice, but now every time she contemplated the memoir, her mind contracted and she felt inexplicably sleepy. It had been months, possibly even a year, since she'd added anything to it. New words just refused to come, and she could barely remember the old ones she'd written. And she was afraid to look. She knew she needed to read through the draft again, to consolidate the structure, and then to start editing and filling in the gaps, but it was too much for her foggy brain to process. The world inside the pages was as dim as a dream. Outside, Oliver was chopping firewood and she could hear the rhythmic thunk of the AX splitting wood. The exercise was good for him. He had been out there for hours. She summoned her resolve and sat up resolutely in her chair. The stout red diary lay on top of the memoir and she picked it up to move it aside. The book felt like a box in her hands. She turned it over. When she was little, she was always surprised to pick up a book in the morning, and open it, and find the letters aligned neatly in their places. Somehow she expected them to be all jumbled up, having fallen to the bottom when the covers were shut. Now had described something similar, seeing the blank pages of Proust and wondering if the letters had fallen off like dead ends. When Ruth had read this, She'd felt a jolt of recognition. 
She placed the diary on the far edge of the desk, out of the way, and then glowered at the manuscript. Perhaps the same sort of thing had happened to her pages. Perhaps she would start reading only to find her words had vanished. Perhaps this would be a good thing. Perhaps it would be a relief. The battered memoir stared balefully back at her. While her mother was still alive, the project had seemed like a good idea. During the long period of decline, Ruth had recorded the gradual erosion of her mother's mind, and she had observed herself, too, making copious notes of her own feelings and reactions. The result was this ungainly heap on the desk in front of her. She scanned the first page and immediately pushed it away. The tone of the writing bugged her, cloying, elegiac. It made her cringe. She was a novelist. She was interested in the lives of others. What had gotten into her, to think she could write a memoir? There was no denying that Now's diary was a distraction. And even though she was determined to pace herself, she had still managed to spend the better part of the day online, looking through lists of names of the victims of the earthquake and tsunami. She'd located a people finder site and run a search for Yasutani. There were several, but no Jikos or Naokos. She didn't know the names of the parents, so she browsed through the files that people had posted of the missing, looking for likely matches. The information was sparse, basic facts about age and sex and residence, where the victims worked, where they'd last been seen, and what they'd been wearing. Often there were pictures, taken in happier times. A grinning boy in his school cap. A young woman, waving at the camera in front of a shrine. A father at an amusement park, holding his child. Below this spare layer of data lay the fullness of the tragedy. All these lives, but none were the lives she was looking for. Finally, she gave up. She needed more information about her Yasutanis, and the only way to find it was to read further in the diary. Ruth closed her eyes. In her mind, she could picture now, sitting by herself in the darkened kitchen, waiting for her mother to bring her father home from the police station. What had those long moments felt like to her? It was hard to get a sense from the diary of the texture of time passing. No writer, even the most proficient, could reenact in words the flow of a life lived, and now was hardly that skillful. The dingy kitchen was dim and still. The bar hostesses moaned and beat against the flimsy wall. The metallic clank of the key in the lock must have startled her, but she stayed where she was. Feet scuffled in the foyer. Did her parents speak? Probably not. She listened to the sound of running water as her mother filled the tub in the bathroom and her father undressed in the bedroom. She didn't move. Didn't look up. Kept her eyes fixed on her fingers, which lay in her lap like dead things. She listened to her father bathe, and then, as her mother grimly looked on, she listened to him stumble through his confession. Did she sneak a glance at his pink cheeks and see it as shame or just the heat of the bath? Did she notice the sweat on his forehead? How many moments passed from the time he started talking until her mother stood and left the room? Did the hum of the flossant light sound particularly loud in the silence? And afterward, in the bedroom she shared with her parents, did she pull the covers over her head, or turn on the light and read a book? or cram for a test that she was sure to fail the next day? Perhaps she went online and googled suicide, men, while her parents slept, or pretended to sleep, back to back, on their separate futons on the floor behind her. If she did, she would have learned, as Ruth had, that suicide surpassed cancer as the leading cause of death for middle-aged men in Japan, so her father was right on target. Was that a consolation? Dressed in her pajamas, she sat in front of the glowing screen in the dark, dimly aware of the sounds of breathing in and out of sync, her father's breath the louder, steady, despite his professed desire for its cessation, her mother's softer, but punctuated from time to time by a sharp panicky nasal intake or an apneic stopping. What did she feel at that moment? 
Ruth opened her eyes. Something was different. She listened. She could hear birds outside, a flock of scoters coming off the water, the tapping of a pileated woodpecker, the liquid plonk and caw of the ravens, but what had caught her attention just now was not a sound, but rather its absence, the rhythmic thunk of Oliver's aches was missing. She felt a quickening of fear. When had it stopped? She stood and walked to the window that overlooked the woodpile. Had he hurt himself? Gotten dizzy and cut off his leg? Rural life was perilous. Every year someone on the island died or drowned or was seriously injured. Their neighbor died picking apples. He'd fallen off his ladder onto his head, and his wife found his body under the tree, surrounded by spilled fruit. Dangers were rife, ladders, fruit trees, slick moss-covered roofs, rain gutters, axes, splitting malls, chainsaws, shotguns, skinning knives, wolves, coggers, high winds, falling tree limbs, rogue waves, faulty wiring, drug dealers, drunk drivers, elderly drivers, suicide, and even murder. She peered out the window. Down below in the driveway, she could see her husband. He looked all right. He was standing on both legs next to the woodpile, with one hand in his pocket and the other on the handle of the axe, staring up into a tree and listening to the ravens. That jungle crow is back again, he said in the bath that night. It's driving the ravens crazy. Ruth grunted. She was brushing her teeth with the electric toothbrush and her mouth was full of toothpaste. Oliver was stretched out in the bathtub flipping through the latest issue of New Science magazine, while Pesto perched on the rim of the tub, next to his head. I was reading about the jungle crows, he said. Apparently they've become a huge problem in Japan. They're very clever. They memorize the schedules for trash pickups and then wait for the housewives to put out the garbage so they can rip it open and steal what's inside. They eat kittens and use wire coat hangers to make nests on utility poles, which short-circuit the lines and cause power outages. The Tokyo Electric Power Company says crows are responsible for hundreds of blackouts a year, including some major ones that even shut down the bullet trains. They have special crow patrols to hunt them down and dismantle their nests, but the crows outsmart them and build dummy nests. Children have to carry umbrellas to school to ward off attacks and protect themselves from droppings, and ladies have stopped wearing shiny clips in their hair. Ruth spat. You sound happy about this, she said into the ball of the sink. I am. I like crows. I like all birds. Do you remember those owl incidents in Stanley Park a couple of years ago? Those joggers that kept showing up in the emergency room with cuts on their heads, complaining about being swooped by owls? The doctors finally put it together. It was fledging season, and the owls were babies, just learning the owling trade. Then someone noticed that the joggers were all balding middle-aged guys with ponytails. Picture it from above, all these shiny pates and flipping rodent lake tails. They must have looked like shiny fishing lures. Irresistible to a baby owl. Ruth stood and wiped her mouth on a towel. You're a balding middle-aged guy, she said. You should be careful. She tapped her fingers lightly on the top of his head on her way to the door. The cat took a swat at her hand. Yes, Oliver said, going back to his issue of new signs. But you'll notice I don't have a ponytail.